Today we will uh, look at some more details what I hinted at last time and go a bit into some more detail. First let us look at the basic storage API. What are, what are these? These are basically how you access storage and what are the other additional things that you need to make sure that your uh, system is usable. So, let us say that uh, there is something called an object ID which refers to something that you want to access. So, the object ID can be a block number, a file name, a file handle, a content hash or a key or there could be other things also, but let us just think about the following. So, I want to be able to get an ID, I want to be able to store some data corresponding to that ID, I want to be able to given the ID, I want to be able to read it into a buffer, sometime later I might want to delete it or sometimes I want to get the metadata of the object itself. Now, this is a, at a some abstract level, these are some of the important ways to interact with the storage system. Basically, the ability to create objects, ability to store, read, delete, get information about object itself. Now, in Unix, there is something called POSIX, which is a portable model in the Unix systems and you will see that there is a corresponding thing for each of these functionalities. For example, the ability to create an object ID is often done through an operation called create and you are basically saying that I want to you to create a, a file with a particular uh, mode, okay. for example, whether it should be read, write, etc. Okay. And uh, it also gives you a handle, a FD is basically a file handle, so that you do not have to refer to this path every single time. It turns out that parsing this path is expensive, so the idea is to avoid doing that and create a convenient handle and the handle is used in the future to refer to this object. Similarly, in POSIX to store you have something called a write, you give the handle that was created here and you because you are storing data, you need to specify where you are getting the data from that is this part and you also specify how many bytes you really want to store and this particular thing returns the size of the thing actually that was written. Similarly, in the case of read, you need to specify where that object the contents have to be stored into that is a buffer and it also tells you how big you want to read and how much actually succeed in reading it. We will again see something interesting here when it comes to delete, uh, it turns out that you have something called unlink which actually does this deletion part. This is not identical to what uh, delete could be basically because in POSIX it turns out that there could be multiple uh, names which can refer to the same object. So, when you unlink it, you are all, all you are doing is you are doing the, reducing the reference count by 1. Okay. If the reference count is equal to 0, then you actually have the same functionality as delete. Okay. You can also have something called getting the information about the object itself. This is what is called a stat call and basically the information that you get about the object is put into the buffer. Now, this object ID as I mentioned to you can be different things. It can be a block number that means that it does not have a, a user uh, visible name, it just got a number. It can be file name that means it has got a user visible name. It can be file handle because it turns out that uh, sometimes for example, in certain uh, uh, storage systems, you give it just like a file descriptor here, you give it a file handle and the file handle is used, I will come to that soon. In some other systems, you have a content hash, basically you retrieve an object by giving a hash of the some parts of the file or the name itself. Similarly, a key also could be used in some context. Now, this is a basic uh, API and this is uh, in different contexts, you will see that this differs in different ways. For example, applications might be very concerned about performance, so they might write their own buffered versions. Okay. So, that is something that we have to uh, 
think about. Okay. Now let us quickly look at uh, how the semantics of these things changes once we introduce something like a network. I think uh, some of you might already know NFS stands for network file systems. Basically, these once the Ethernet uh, came into picture, then the feasibility of accessing storage in remote nodes became possible and network file systems were devised about early 1980s and they are still used quite widely. Okay. And uh, basically, you will see that networking actually has an impact on our semantics. We will just look at how it, how it happens. Let us see the first one. In POSIX, if you have a file descriptor, if you have the file descriptor, you can hold it as long as the process exists. If the process disappears, you lost the handle okay, and you have to again get another handle. Okay. Uh, so, it is not something uh, which is permanent, it is only as long as the process exists. Whereas, the NFS, it has a different semantics because it is now across, the storage is across multiple nodes. Now, there is a notion of a client and server. Now, the file handle is kept by the client. So, the handle is valid okay, as long as the client exists. The client disappears, of course, then you do not have to worry about the server having to produce that object when requested. But once a client has a handle, the server by definition is expected to be able to retrieve that object once the client produces that handle again. Okay. So, of course, this is impossible in practice because uh, there is no way to keep a, uh, you know, a server to always respond to any handle because finally, um, that is essentially it is unlimited amount of time which is just impossible. Okay. So, but anyway, in principle it is means that in, uh, reason, in reasonably long times, for a long time, given a handle, the server should be able to produce it. Okay. So, for example, in the NFS case, if the uh, server dies, the client still has the, uh, the handle, then it is expected that once the server comes up, it is still able to service that particular request. Okay. So, the basic design in the NFS is server is stateless, the client is stateful. So, the server does not remember anything about whether it has um, let us say uh, any files that were accessed in the past etc. does not know anything about these things, it does not keep track of all those things. But given that there is a handle given out, the next time somebody asks for it, it should be able to provide it. Okay. So, in a sense that handle should encode something which the server can use to retrieve the object. Okay. So, you can see there is a difference in the way the semantics has changed. This file descriptor in the context of a single machine is uh, file descriptor is valid only as long as the process exists, but in the case of NFS, the handle exists, handle is meaningful as long as the client exists. Similar things happen in the case of uh, some other types of usages or EDMs in uh, certain file systems. For example, in many file systems, you have the notion of what is called open but deleted file. And this kind of EDM exists because it uh, you want to unnecessarily not keep around files that are temporary. So, the idea is that you create a temporary file and you open it, but then delete it. And the idea is that when the process exits, that file also is removed automatically. That is the basic idea. Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out that this one is not feasible to be uh, supported with the same semantics in NFS. Okay. It turns out the NFS client has to do certain tricky things to make sure that this particular thing happens. Similarly, in the case of consistency, it turns out that NFS, especially the version 2, has very weak consistency guarantees. The reason why this happens is because the client's cache metadata for some amount of time, let us say for 30 seconds. So, it assumes that nobody has modified it for 30 seconds. But of course, it is a totally unsustainable argument when you have lots of uh, multiple parties updating the same file, but this is what is assumed. So, in NFS later versions, they have notions of what is called a lease by which you can uh, uh, essentially, it is not allowed to be modified by multiple parties 
until the owner actually uh, that guy that person's uh, lease expires. Okay. So, there are uh, there is a lot of subtle differences that crop up once you allow certain different types of access or certain something like networking into the picture. Again, let us just uh, look at the impact of networking in a slightly different angle. It turns out that the semantics of failure become quite important also. For example, NFS uses something called remote procedure calls and once you have this, you have to start worrying about what is called non-item potent operators. What are these? For example, normally when the client requests some service, either it can be done any number of times without uh, the result being different. For example, if I can ask a read to be done on a particular file, I can do it multiple times and still the same result should come out. Whereas, uh, so that will be example of an item potent operation. If you have a non item potent operations, it means that you cannot repeat it multiple times and get the same result. A good example is, suppose I delete a file. The first time the file exists, so when I delete it, it probably says yes, I succeeded in deleting it. But the second time you repeat it, that file should, it's already gone. Therefore, it should return saying that I didn't find the file. So there are certain non ident potent operations. Why is this important in the case of RPC or in the case of networking? It's because I ask you to do something. It may be that that the operation was done, but the response got lost, or it may be that my request in the first place never made it. Okay. So the idea in NFS has been always that you do at least you keep repeating, you retry the operation. So, if you have to retry a delete operation for example, then you will get different results depending on exactly what happened. Okay. So, the semantics of will become very important and uh, so this is different again from POSIX. Similarly, the consistency issues become important as I mentioned before. It also turns out that you might need new kernel infrastructure because you are doing high speed transfers, you, you might need different kinds of infrastructure and again as we looked at in the first class. It turns out that the minute you have networking, you can start doing different types of uh, larger scale systems. For example, storage networks where we use protocols at the block level or you can do it at the file level which is basically what I mentioned just now this network file systems or you can think of even larger scale systems, distributed file systems or storage systems. So, the impact of any one particular thing like networking has ramifications all over the place. Again, you can see how the API itself changes. In POSIX, you say read file descriptor buffer and count and POSIX also allows you to do partial writes. You can do appends, you can do overwrites, you can do seeks, etc. Okay. You can do an operation called mmap also, okay, which maps a particular file to certain some areas in the virtual memory. Whereas, if you look at NFS, you will find that because it is a stateless model, it can never remember that implicit pointer where you are supposed to be reading it. In the case of POSIX, there is always an implicit, uh, let us say, pointer from where you are reading things. Whereas, NFS, the server does not keep track of this quote implicit pointer because it is stateless. So, therefore, the client has to explicitly mention the offset. Okay. Everything else is same, the buffer and count are same, but the client has to supply an additional argument called offset. Again, the NFS has been designed to be as close to POSIX as possible. Therefore, partial writes are supported and MMAP also is supported. And this is very critical because without MMAP, you cannot support certain virtual memory operations and also executing files, executing executables residing in remote uh, file systems. Okay. But there are some things again also missing again from the point of view of stateless design. For example, there is no open because the server is not supposed to keep track of what files are open because it is a stateless design. And again, NFS as I mentioned before, it has a weak consistency model with multiple writers and later models like NFS 3 and NFS 4 improve the consistency models. For example, NFS 4 has a notion of leases. That means that uh, somebody wants to write it, he takes a lease and then that party only has access to that file for updating purposes and only once the lease expires, somebody else can get hold of it. Okay. Now, let us look at this is one is POSIX, one is NFS. Now, let us look at a more uh, recent uh, version of 
how to access storage. Amazon has a S3 storage service. It is what is called a key value store. And what it means is that you do not have uh, uh, some of the various uh, uh, aspect like in POSIX, all you have is a key value store. What it means is given a key, it produces a value and they do not give you any other additional details. Okay. And uh, it does not have features like partial write, nor can it support MMAP. These things are make, make sense because S3 is designed for uh, using what is called the for cloud services. That means that nobody is going to do, um, let us say, using S3 for uh, something like virtual memory operations. That does not make sense for this because you are not thinking of supporting virtual memory operations, you know, you do not need MMAP. Okay. Similarly, features like partial write are not supported because it is uh, too costly for them to support this model because all they have is a particular key has a particular value. If you keep writing partial writes, that means the key might have to keep changing, which is a problem, so they do not try to support it. If you look at NFS, it has certainly a weaker consistency model than what we are used to in a Unix system, but it turns out Amazon will go for even weaker models. Okay. For example, because this happening on wide area networks where uh, basically networks can fail, so or you can get the data from multiple paths, it turns out that the uh, multiple updates can come out of order. Because they can come out of order, they cannot guarantee that consistent views maintained across all clients. So, they have a slightly different model which is uh, called eventually, eventually consistent model and all they say is the following which is a very weak guarantee just basically says that when no updates occur for a sufficiently long period of time, eventually all updates will propagate to the system and all the replicas will be consistent. Okay. That is all the guarantee. The reason why you talk about replicas is because it is a service on the, on the cloud and networks etc are much more not as reliable as electrical connections within a single desktop system for example. Therefore, you often times have multiple replicas to avoid failures uh, if uh, one of them is inaccessible and so you have to any particular write has to be propagated to multiple places and if you try to propagate to multiple places then you need to have some way of saying when those three copies or four copies they are consistent with each other and that cannot be guaranteed easily in the cloud. So, that is why they have a slightly weaker model and with this weaker model we have to find a way of uh, accessing your storage. Again, let us just quickly look at the kinds of uh, uh, operations supported by something like the Amazon storage series. This S3 stores data in named buckets. Each bucket is a flat namespace containing keys. Okay. So, basically for each key there is an object and you put multiple objects in a bucket. The maximum object size is 5 gigabytes. It turns out that uh, partial reads are allowed, but as I mentioned earlier partial writes are not allowed. Okay. That means that if you want to update something partially, you need to come up with another object uh, that which you can upload in full. So, the kinds of operations that they support are create bucket, again this is similar to the POSIX create, put bucket key object, this is similar to the write operation, all you are saying is in this particular bucket, I want you to uh, write this object with a particular key. Here is basically access, this is a read call, basically you are saying that given the key, please give me the, in a particular uh, bucket, please give me the object. I can delete that particular object given the key. I can delete the complete bucket, that is all the objects that are present in that. Again, you can think of a bucket as something like a directory okay. or you can list all the keys in a bucket and you can list, list all the buckets also. Okay. So, this is the type of operation supported. Okay. So, usually they do not go beyond this. For example, there is no M map etc as I mentioned before. Okay. So, basically this is a slightly more limited model, but if you are storing things like photographs and what not, probably this is a good enough model. You do not need anything much more complex than this. But if you are planning to support, the storage has to support something like virtual memory operations, then this will not be sufficient. So, this brings us to uh, 
why there are differences in the storage systems and how they can be uh, let us say uh, made sense of. Okay. So, first of all again to reiterate the point there are varied uses of storage. For example, I can use storage for swap purposes in a uh, desktop system. I can use it as a document store for example, I store photographs etcetera. I can do archiving that is I need to keep the storage for a long period of time because it is required by legal or other reasons okay. or I can even do something simpler like I use some storage for temporary information transfer. For example, I carry a memory stick and I want to transfer it from one machine to another machine. So, there are varieties of uses of storage and so there are many designs for each of these things. I just listed a few of them, but there can be quite a few more. Okay. Now, if I want to understand the all the varieties in which I can use a storage, it turns out it is good to understand the various possibilities by thinking of a storage system as a layered system with many optional layers. Depending on what layers I produce, I can have different kinds of functionalities. For example, if I take a swap on a desktop system, usually the places where I store the inf the pages, the user does not have to really know those names etc. It is the job of the operating system to keep track of it, there is no user visible component. So, for this block storage is, part, part is quite fine, I do not need anything better than this. If I have a document for example, there could be something more interesting that I need to do here basically because documents are have a lot of importance in society. It can for example, if you in India for example, you have this uh, something called uh, right information act. So, if some document is produced, you may want to know who produced it, when was it produced, how it got modified etcetera. That means, that you need to keep lot of metadata about the document itself. There uh, basically, what, what is often called provenance this is very important. Okay. So, document stores for example, worry a lot about provenance okay, because legal cases are fought on base of this provenance. Okay. Emails are important, they, when, was, when was email sent that is important issue. Okay. So, you need to be able to store it and most important is that in some cases you need to make sure that this provenance does not change, you cannot modify the provenance, you cannot lie about how the some, some aspect metadata. Okay. So, this particular kind of systems will have a slightly different focus because they are worried about legal aspects sometimes. In archiving, there is a different aspect altogether. You worry about reliability because if I if I am worried about the fact that some data might disappear, I make copies, I archive it let us say and if my archiving cannot give me good guarantees, then it is absolutely useless because the reason why I am archiving it is because to take care of a contingent situation of losing it, which may happen very rarely actually usually. Okay, does not happen that often, but if in that rare situation if it is not going to work then it is absolutely useless. That means, that this has to be rock solid. Okay. Whatever you do it has to be absolutely trustworthy in terms of ability to produce a document when requested again. Okay. So, this is quite critical. The other aspect that is important in archiving which is not so important on some of these other things is eliminating redundancy. Why? Because as time progresses I keep on accumulating data or documents. So, I cannot keep on keeping multiple copies or extra copies without control. I need to make sure that I need to keep only controlled amount of redundancy in it, not unbounded redundancy. I have to make sure that if it is possible for me to uh, store it with less amount of storage, it is better. Okay. I will introduce redundancy as I need it with respect to as I determine from reliability, but there should be control on how much redundancy is there, okay. it cannot be just arbitrary. Okay. So, archiving will have different ideas. So, it turns out that if you think of storage systems, you might think of it as multiple layers and it helps us understanding systems by thinking that there is some kind of layering there and we will follow a very simple model for the time being, we will just say that it is based on devices, protocols and systems. Actual system is much more complicated, but we will think of this as for a start and then to give an example how deep it can be, we will just take an example. Okay. As I mentioned, we will just think of it as some simpler model, but actual system is fairly complex. Let us take a simple uh, access to a storage system. 
I can will use a traditional desktop system. An application will access some piece of uh, storage using something called f open, f read or f write. These are calls that are the libc level. And libc actually in turn translates this into some system calls, open, read and write system calls. The system calls find they finally are executed in the kernel and the kernel finally actually calls uh, some things called VOP underscore open etc. This is way to ensure that the kernel uh, is flexible with respect to the different types of file systems that can be on the on the different types of file systems that can be on the desktop system. Okay. So, uh, so this is the file system independent way of calling those routines by the kernel. Again, this gets translated into a file system specific call. For example, there is something called Unix file system that is there in BSD file systems and uh, some other operating systems. And so, this file system independent open call is translated through certain function pointers into a file system specific uh, call, UFS open, UFS read, etc. And these things are implemented by the file system using the virtual memory subsystem. And the virtual memory subsystem in turn uses the file system to actually access the disk, actually access the file system. It uses something called get page and put page. And at the lower level of recursion, these things actually call the device routines. And again, there is a huge amount of layering going on here. That is why I am calling it a pseudo device routine. They actually, this does not even touch the actual device with the disk. It is going through layers of software before it finally touches that the disk. Okay. So, for example, there could be something called a volume manager. A volume manager is often used to aggregate multiple disks. So, you might want to have a disk which is let us say 100 gigabytes, whereas the biggest that is available is right now 3 uh, made a mistake, I am sorry. The you may want to have a, a storage device which is uh, let us say 100 terabytes but the biggest disk available now is 3 terabytes. So, is it possible to construct a 100 terabyte virtual disk out of multiple 3 terabyte disks? That is what a volume manager does. Okay. So, this again is a piece of software. This is not hardware, this is basically a piece of software. Again, this volume manager in turn talks to device driver, again it is a piece of software which talks to uh, for example, varieties of disks. We will talk about SCSI disks mostly because this is the most uh, flexible type of disk. Okay. And this particular SCSI disk will talk to an agent called HBA, so that it insulates itself from the many interrupts the device will uh, send to the CPU otherwise, okay. host bus adapter. Okay. This host bus adapter actually in turn finally talks to the disk. This is one type of layering that is going on. If you are talking about networked file system, from warp get page you can actually go to the NFS client code and that in turn will talk to a network driver. The network driver in turn will talk to the network interface card and that in turn goes to the other side to the remote disk and it has to traverse another uh, its own set of these units on the other remote disk on the remote uh, machine. But it, the, from the NIC it might go to the other remote machine and there it might have to go through a volume manager and device driver, HB and disk button. You can see that from this there is a fairly large sequence of things that happens and you will also so see that this network stack actually is a part of your storage stack because this network stack is somewhere here and all this stuff is here. So, the seven layer network uh, layering model that you might have come across in the ISO model um, in whatever form it is also is present somewhere here. Okay. Uh, storage systems have not uh, been formalized to that extent like the network uh, uh, systems because the by definition the network systems have to interoperate they have to interoperate without that there is no point networking so if you want to interoperate you have to really codify exactly how you can talk to each other that's why there has been a uh, serious attempt set coming up with layers of uh, which can be mapped to each other in spite of different systems Whereas in the storage systems, it does not happen to the same extent, but it is beginning to happen. Even though it is, uh, let us say, has the similar kinds of multiple layers. So, again, so we will just uh, look at layering a bit. Uh, 
uh, so what do we what do we mean by layers basically these are uh, either uh, different software layers along with certain uh, possibly certain layers being in hardware itself and each of them specializes in one dimension but each layer also typically handles some other dimensions also a good example let's take the case of file system typically the file system is available or used because it provides a convenient naming as required by applications and end users there is also a notion of what is called a raw disk for example where no naming is provided and it's very difficult to use a database for example can use raw disks but managing those disks becomes difficult and therefore often times many files many databases actually run on top of a file system because the file system takes care of some of these issues about managing the so many raw disk blocks okay. so file system has a particular functionality as i mentioned one important thing is naming similarly volume manager handles aggregation of physical media along with error management okay, it's a different kinds of functionality now it turns out that if you uh separate this functionality in these two layers file system doing one thing and volume manager sometimes it simplifies the software design so that there is some kind of uh division of labor but at the same time it can also create complications basically because if each of them is designed independently then certain types of performance guarantees that you want to provide may not be possible okay. it might become more difficult okay so layering is good simplifies your ability to come up with software but it can also prevent certain things from happening a good example is let's take real time aspects with respect to access so now we have to ensure that if there is somebody doing real time access for example you have what is called multimedia file systems and you might want to guarantee that each access happens within particular amount of time now if you are split into two parts file system and volume manager okay then it means that if you want to give real time guarantees then you have to work both of them have to work together but if they are independently designed it might be not so easy to do it so that's the reason why often times if you are thinking about real time aspects or security or any other aspects a integrated design is often better and often times you'll find that this kind of layering sometimes can be problematic and so depending on the seriousness seriousness with which you have to support certain uh, property you may decide to go with layering or you might want to club the different layers in different ways and uh, or you might want to do with layering uh um uh, that interface with the property that you want to uh, support um so for example there are file systems like xfs which uh, club file system the naming part as well as the volume manager together there are some other designs which do the different things for example linux typically has these two different file system and volume manager is the two different things the one aspect about layering is that each layer also needs to do in its own way some various functionalities for example discovery naming error management security performance consumer let me just mention one or two things about each of these things what is discovery discovery means if there is a layer it has to figure out what is out there let's say you are at the lowest level the device developer needs to know how many devices are there okay so the devices might be attached to a bus and at the booting time it has to figure out what are all the disks that are out there or suppose that i am at the nfs level i want to find out which network file systems are available that i can mount i should be able to access so there are remote many remote machines exporting many different remote file systems and i need to figure out where they are okay so that's some kind of discovery how is there a way in which i can discover where things are and notice that this has to be there at every layer it's not just has to be constant in one layer it has to be there at every layer okay. naming also same story we already looked at file system that it provides naming as required by applications or at, or users you will find that this naming also is required for at multiple levels again to look at the most simple case let's take the case of disks in linux for example we have something called 
slash dev sda slash dev sdb etc okay so you have two disks one of them might be called a slash dev sda another thing can be called slash dev sdb now linux has used this simple model for quite some time and this turns out to be somewhat problematic when you go to very large scale systems suppose you are running a big database system and you require about 500 disks now having all this slash dev sda sdb etc becomes a big headache you actually want to do it slightly more differently and typically what you have to do is you have to do it based on the structure of the system structure by which you are actually connecting all the disks themselves so there are different more sophisticated models by which you name these disks and uh, so for large installation this becomes very important and it's very crucial because in when a system is running when a disk fails you might have to replace it when you want to replace it you may have to not make you should of course ideally not make any mistakes so for that you know all these kind of things are very critical how to name them how to ensure that the right things happen when some uh, error management has to take place okay. okay similarly error management so the error management that happens at a file system is different from that happens in a volume manager and that's different from what happens in the disk level for example if you are at nfs level network file system level if you try to access a file on the remote file on the remote uh, machine then you retry okay so you keep retrying till you get it because you have a handle and nfs guarantees that if you have a handle you are supposed to be able to access the device, access the file or the object so all it does is retry and there are various models something called hard retries sorry hard mounting and soft mounting in soft mounting you do it a few number of times and then give up in hard mounting you keep on doing it till you get it okay now similar thing happens in the case of scsi devices also in a scsi device you uh, they are sitting on a bus and some device driver tries to access a particular disk or a particular offset now there can be any anything that can there can be multiple things that can happen it, because let's assume that this are on a electrical bus now electrical buses can malfunction if they malfunction then you also again have to retry till somebody has done what is called a bus reset to do a bus reset then whatever electrical malfunction is there that might be taken care of and again it can you can again uh, retry and probably it will go through okay. so every single layer incorporates some aspect of error management same thing as security so if you are uh, looking at uh, uh, let's say the security of data then the file system will probably handle it one way the volume manager will do it in probably slightly different ways depending on the context and uh, so for example a file system might encrypt it and it will do its own key management volume manager might decide that since the file system is doing it i don't have to worry about it that's not my business okay or nowadays you can get disks with encryption possible seagate for example sells some disks in which the whole disk can be encrypted okay so this is not at the file system level not at the volume management level it is much lower at the device level itself okay. that also is possible okay. again performance also has to be managed at each of these layers in its own ways for example some layers will do caching some layers have to do flow control for example if i'm doing nfs then usually nfs uses udp and so i might have to actually manage how i pump the network with udp packets that is some part of that's something that nfs client has to manage similarly consistency management we will discuss this in some detail each party might have to worry about certain aspects relating to consistency for example volume manager as i mentioned handles multiple disks so if a, if a particular disk dies then it has to update its data about what disks are available and it has to have a consistent model of what disks are available what disks are uh, uh, suffering transient errors but are actually okay etc okay. similarly consistency management in a network file system you have to ensure that if multiple guys are writing to a file 
do you guarantee that everybody sees the same um, let us say view of the file or or do you leave it to NFS which basically says I do not guarantee uh, those guys except at the consistency except at 30 second intervals or something something similar. Okay. And if you are talking about web scaled systems like S3 you have to worry about consistency as you mentioned earlier you worry about things like uh, eventual consistency models. Okay. So, every layer also has to do it somewhere. Okay. So, what we will do right now is to quickly look at uh, I would like to go through the whole of the stack up and down as, as a part of this course, but what we will do is we will start with the simplest possible thing. Okay. We will look at the disks. I say the simplest, but actually it is not a simple thing at all. It is actually a very complicated device and this has been dominant since 1956 and they essentially replace tape. Before 1956, tape was the primary medium for storing things, but nowadays tape is uh, some kind of it is used only in special special archival kind of situations. And this case quite dominant even today, but it is possible that uh, in the next 20 years or so it can get replaced by something called storage class memories, flash being one recent example of it. Okay. So, this is still let us say not uh, optional we still have to go through using this, but I think someday it might get replaced. What is good about this is that it has got high density with good bandwidth. The biggest problems are that it has got high seek and rotation release. Okay. It has got acceptable reliability, but for large storage systems it is a big issue. That is why you will notice that large scale file systems like Google file system etcetera, they worry about this and their design takes care of reliability as an important aspect. Some of the reasons why you worry about them is because this can um, let us say they consume power, they produce a lot of heat, they vibrate and because of vibration it may turn out that you might instead of reading a particular track on the disk you might read something else that also is possible. Okay. So, a disk is really on the if you think about the whole thing it is quite a good device that is why it has survived for 5 decades or more. Okay, it is still surviving, they still go on our laptops most of them still come with disk. It also turns out that most software as of now all assume that disks are sitting out there. For example, file system and databases they are all optimized thinking that there are disks out there. Of course, this has to change once we move to storage class memories. Okay. This is going to be a big major change as things happen. Okay. Again just to give a high level idea about uh, disks, you will see that disks have changed over a period of time. In the beginning they, put, they gave very little functionality, all you saw was a read write amplifier analog. Okay. It had only what is called soft setting that means there was nothing on the disk itself from hardware point of view which could say that something is a sector, a sector being unit of transfer it has to be done by software only. Now, once you have hard sectoring then you can possibly do certain things independent the disk can do something independently it does not have to depend on software doing it. And it may be that hardware is going to can be more effective at this low level things low level operations if you do it at a high level from the CPU side it is a lot of work. Okay. So, in a sense if you have hard sectoring a lot of the housekeeping jobs can be done by the device itself does not have to go to all the way it does not have to travel all the way up to the CPUs to or the software to handle it. Similarly, there is a second generation of disk called ESDI disk came in ok. It provided hard sectoring, it provided what is called defect list drive. What it means is that if you tried writing to some place and it was proved to be difficult for whatever reasons, then it will say that that particular sector is defective and it will keep note of it on the disk itself. So, that it would not try to write to that one it will actually vector to the some other area specially kept for handling defects of this kind. Okay. So, uh, so there are various things that the next generation did. If you look at SCSI disks they provide lot more additional functionality they provide some data buffers some more sophisticated controllers and 
these are quite suitable for large scale systems and uh, these are currently the best disk that you can get and in all high uh, high end installations you will see only SCSI disk. Now it is possible for you uh, for us to use SCSI disk but it turns out that you need an agent as I mentioned HBAs on the uh, CPU side. So you need HBA on the CPU side and then you can access access SCSI disk. Now, for low cost systems like IBM PC etc, it turned out having HBA was a cost, uh, costly affair. So, they integrated the HBA with this disk and they produce what is called IDE or iterate kind of disks. Okay. So, basically the host adapter is in the drive itself and basically it is a electrical interface it's directly attached to the motherboard of the system. Okay. So, from a certain cost point of view because it is mostly electronics the more you do large scale integration the less expense you have to suffer and so ID eta disks are basically similar to SCSI disks except that the host bus adapter is sitting on the motherboard itself directly. Okay. The only problem is that it works only with IBM PC and that means that whatever these guys are doing assumes that there is an IBM PC sitting out there. That means that it assumes that there are only two disks out there possible. Maximum the bus can support is two disks or four disks or whatever it is and so everything is geared with those kind of assumptions. Now, this is not good if I am talking about a high end system where I can have something like as many as uh, 30 or 40 disks and uh, making this assumption that only 2 or 3 disks like IDE or ETA, disk, uh, ETA buses assume okay, is not a good thing. Okay. So, these are suitable for larger systems, but you have the expense of a host bus adapter. Here, the host bus adapters are integrated, but they can only be used in limited situations. And this IDE ETA has uh, changed into SATA and uh, devices. Again, the difference being that uh, this is mostly to electrical reasons. It turns out that uh, these disks started with 8 bit interfaces, electrical interfaces, then it becomes 16 bit interfaces, then it becomes 32 bit interfaces. Now, it turns out that if you keep going to larger number of bits to be sent at the same time, there are some issues called clock skew. Okay. The signals do not propagate at high when at the higher uh, uh, megahertz and the same way there is some clock skew which creates problems. So, what people do is they provide what is called a serial versions of this. That means that the instead of providing 32 bits parallel which uh, and uh, clocking them is somewhat difficult uh, makes it very more intricate the electrical design becomes more difficult. You can provide what is called a serial uh, type of thing at much higher uh, frequencies. Okay. So, for example, you can have uh, currently you get uh, 3 gigabit per second SATA devices. That means you send only 1 bit at a time, but at 3 gigabit per second. Okay. Uh, those buses can handle those. Okay. So, uh, the bus can handle 3 gigabit per second, but the devices might be able to pump it at something like 600 megabit per second. Okay. This is serial. Okay. So, Similarly, for SCSI, you have something called SAS, serial SCSI, and uh, same problems. I cannot uh, electrically drive 32 bits without clock skew because that is difficult thing I do uh, SAS. Okay. This is just a basic uh, introduction. I am pretty sure there is a lot more detail to be understood if you want to study, but this is some high level idea. Mm -hmm. Now, let us just look at some aspects of the disk. The disks are poor at random read write but better at sequential okay. and seeking activity important factor in performance. So, I have to minimize this seek time. Basic reason is that each seek takes about 2 to 10 milliseconds and that is a quite a long time and uh, so I need to figure out ways of reducing this seek time and that is why as I mentioned a lot of software is designed to make sure this does not uh, uh, this is minimized as much as possible. Similarly, you want to minimize rotational latency, okay, waiting for the disk to rotate the desired sector on the read write head. Okay. And you can see this uh, effects of this seek time and rotational latency in many applications you might use. For example, open office, many people who have used it will might have noticed that the startup takes too long. And basically, the reason why that happens is because you need a lot of excessive seeks, and this excessive seeks 
uh, is about as many as 100 of them that is basically what causes open of to become quite slow. The exact reasons are slightly more complicated which I am not going to get into. So, again we need to uh, look at the kinds of uh, uh, given that you have a disk you may want to think about how to schedule operations on it so that we can do better than what is happening right now. For example, you can have what is called first come first serve that is as requests come in you do it in the same order. This is not good because I could be on one part of the disk and then if I get an access on the other side of the disk or in the center of the disk uh, that is from one end of the disk to the other end uh, the center of the disk for example, then I will be seeking a lot. So, that is why this first come first serve could be a problem there could be some other types like called shortest seek time first because if seek is so important then why not try to find the uh, seek that is closest next. So, for example, somewhere at, at a particular point in the disk I find the seek which is to be service which is closest to where I am ok and this also has been attempted but the one which has been widely used is what is called elevator or scan ok. It is similar to the way we use elevators. So, disk arm starts at one end of the disk and moves towards the other end just like elevator starts from the one end of the thing all the way goes all the way up ok and servicing requests as it goes and reverses direction then to the disk. This turns out to be a fairly good model ok. Similar thing is syscan same as this scan model except head returns to cylinder 0 in this it is like an elevator situation you go all the way up and immediately drop all the way down to the lowest floor and this is it might seem very strange why people are doing it but this gives you some. Uh, let us say uh, more real time guarantees okay. it is better at handling the latency is seen by uh, is not that high for some uh, basically the variance is not very high with this. C okay. look is similar to syscan except that head only travels as per the last request in each direction ok that is you do not go all the way to the end of the disk ok you only go as much as what is available ok requests are there. Again, we just quickly look at uh, the disk scheduling. Uh, again, these are the ones what I said earlier were some of the classical disk scheduling algorithms. And in the recent past, again, there has been a lot of work. And uh, for example, we have the elevator algorithm which Linus implemented long time back, which was default till 2003. There is also a deadline version imposes a deadline all I/O operations to prevent resource starvation. You can have what is called anticipatory, which was used quite a bit in Linux systems, but now it is no longer the default actually it has been removed ok. Uh, this one what it does is the idea is that if you are doing a disk operation it is very likely that you will be doing another operation nearby ok. So, uh, instead of trying to do some other uh, unrelated access you see if you one more access or some nearby thing comes in so that you can do it better ok. So, that is the anticipatory. This turned out to be quite interesting once upon a time, but people are finding that, that uh, it is not as good in many other situations. So, there is something called completely fair queuing has come in and basically what you do is you allocate time slices for each of the per process queues for both asynchronous requests and asynchronous synchronous and asynchronous requests for access to the disk. So, basically there is a queue for uh, there are multiple queues for uh, there are per process queues and they are maintained for both synchronous requests as well as asynchronous requests and you allocate time slices for them and then based on that you uh, do the scheduling. There is also something called null that means you do not do any uh, modification of the request as they come in they you order you do it in the, the way they come in more or less the first come first serve. So, I will just briefly look at how critical it is to do uh, these things well. Uh, suppose you have a uh, uh, a streaming write that means you are doing very very long big writes ok mm -hmm. basically keep on writing it. Th what this guy is doing is is writing zeros ok to a file with a block size of 1 megabyte. So, this is the background thing and then you do a foreground read of a large file. So, basically you are the 200 megabyte file you are catting it to none do slash done. So, basically you want to find out how much it takes this one example. The similar thing about a streaming read in the background and you are trying to traverse a deep directory and cat every file in it that is list every file in it ok. Now, 
I just want to show you how differently the performance of uh, based on the different types of scheduling that can be attempted. So, if you look at it for example, the results can be quite dramatically different. For example, in the case of the elevator algorithm if it takes 45 seconds, anticipated I/O scheduler takes about one tenth of it. In the case of uh, the previous other one basically this looking into this high uh, read latency because you are basically having a steaming read right. You can see the variety of results that you get the difference being as much as 30 minutes to 15 seconds okay. So, it is very important that you your scheduling is right because if you do not get this right you can see a huge difference in performance and that is why there has been a lot of a uh, lot of software tries to figure out for a particular application how best to use the disk ok. So, that is a lot of work is done in this area. Mm -hmm. I think we will like to stop here at this point. So, let us basically mention that we looked at the basic API for storage, we discussed briefly some aspects of layering and we started looking at the physical layer ok. I will continue in the next class about the physical layer aspect of it a bit more and then we will look at SCSI disks a bit and then afterward we will proceed on to some of the layers. <laughs>